So welcome back to our Bible. Day 21, be honest before God. What does it mean to be honest before God? Honesty before our creator comes from confidence, from experience, the true grace of God. Be honest before God in prayer. Cry out to him and pour out your struggles before him, the pure heart. Be honest before God also means being honest and trustworthy to those in our closest circles and those in our communities. Courage before God has honesty, integrity, and truth, no matter the circumstances. In the name of the Father, Son, and the Holy Spirit. And now we're going to ask the Lord. And now we're going to ask the Lord to shine into our hearts, the loving master, the pure light of your divine knowledge. And open up the eyes of our mind that we may understand your teachings in scripture. Help us to apply what we learn that you're having conquered simple desires. We may pursue a spiritual way of life, thinking and doing all the things that are pleasing to you. You Christ are God. You are a light. And to you we get glory. Father, Son, Holy Spirit, now and forever. The sages, amen. Lord is our shepherd. All right, we'll get right into it. We'll get over, get our screen shared. Our first reading, Wisdom, Psalms, chapter 12. So thank you all again for following. Get the screen shared over. So we'll begin. So begin right here in Psalms 12. So Psalms chapter 12. For the director of music, according a Psalm of David, starting in verse 1, name of the Father, Son, and the Holy Spirit. It says, help, Lord, for no one is faithful anymore. For those who are loyal have vanished from the human race. Everyone lies to their neighbor. They flatter with their lips, but harbor deception in their hearts. May the Lord silence all the flattering lips and every boastful tongue. Those who say by our tongues we will prevail. Our own lips will defend us. Who is Lord over us? Because the poor, because the poor have plundered and the needy grown. I will now arise, says the Lord. I will protect them from those who are malign. Them. And the words of the Lord are flawless. Like silver purified the crucible, like gold refined seven times. You, Lord, will keep the needy safe and will protect us forever from the wicked who freely strut about when that is vile is honored by the human race. In the Father, Son, and the Holy Spirit. Beautiful. Beautiful. So here we see in Psalms 12, right? We see another psalm, right? Another psalm here by David where he's crying out to the Lord, asking for help as he approaches his Lord in prayer. And David goes on to be extremely honest before God. He cries out to the Lord that no one is faithful anymore. And metaphorically, he says, the loyal have vanished from the human race. But David is saying that those who used to be loyal have now joined the ways of the wicked. David is describing here in the psalm and before God, a society of people who have hardened their hearts and seem to have forsaken mercy and have forsaken seeking the true knowledge of God. David is also providing us a great example of the importance of being honest before God and pouring out our struggles. God desires this type of relationship in us all. Seek him, seek that relationship and give him your heart and he does the rest if you are willing. A little fun fact about Psalms 12, look at verse 6. Like silver purified in a crucible, like gold refined seven times. Right? So let's look at the Hebrew word, because right? depending on your Bibles, right, is either going to be crucible or furnace. Here's the Hebrew word. Strong's H fifty nine forty eight. Aleo. 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 Means furnace, crucible depending on the version of your Bible. So, so it means furnace or crucible. And according to the NIV, Cultural Background Study Bible, this word is being used because of the mention of silver and is applying that what is being described is a clay crucible used for smelting purposes. Right? Look at Proverbs. Proverbs chapter 17, verse 3 says, the crucible for silver, the furnace for gold, but the Lord tests the heart. So crucibles, they also appear in e Egyptian wall paintings. 
and also in clay examples that archaeologists have found. When it's, we go back to Psalms, let's talk about refined seven times, right? So in verse six, refined seven times. So God tests the heart, right? So refined seven times. It is said that the refining process of silver can be a very long process to remove all the dos. Seven is a number of completion, right? So it's also a spiritual number. So how often does our faith have to be refined, right? So David was refining his faith, right? How many times do we have to be refined in our faith? Think about it. How many times do we go through the fire, right? The test right, of our faith. It's beautiful. Right? It's beautiful. So here, David is also cleansing himself in this prayer. Our New Testament reading. Matthew, starting in Matthew chapter 14, starting in verse 22, will end in Matthew chapter 15, verse 9. So Jesus walks on the sea. In the name of the Father, Son, and the Holy Spirit. And immediately Jesus made the disciples get into the boat and go before him to the other side. Well, he sent the multitudes away. And when he had sent the and when he had sent the multitudes away, he went up on the mountain by himself to pray. Now, when evening came, he was alone there. But the boat was now in the middle of the sea, tossed by the waves, for the wind was contrary. Now, in the fourth watch of the night, Jesus went to them, walking on the sea. And when the disciples saw him walking on the sea, they were troubled, saying, It is a ghost. And they cried out for fear. But immediately Jesus spoke to them, saying, Be of good cheer. It is I. Do not be afraid. And Peter answered him and said, Lord, if it is you, command me to come to you on the water. And he said, come. When Peter had come down out of the boat, he walked on the water to go to Jesus. But when he saw that the wind was boisterous, he was afraid and, and beginning to sink, he cried out saying, Lord, save me. And immediately Jesus stretched out his hand and caught him and said to him, oh, you have little faith. Why did you doubt? And when they got into the boat, the wind ceased. Then those who were in the boat came and worshiped him, saying, Truly, you are the Son of God. Many touch him and are made well. When they had crossed over, they came to the land. And when the men of that place recognized him, they sent out into all that surrounding region, brought to him all who were sick, and begged him that they might only touch the hem of his garment. And as many as touched it were, were made perfectly well in the father son and the holy spirit matthew chapter 15 the defilement comes from within and the scribes and the pharisees who were from jerusalem came to jesus saying why do your disciples trans transgress the tradition of the elders for they're not washing their hands when they eat bread and he answered and said to them why do you also transgress the commandments of god because of your tradition because of your tradition for god commanded saying honor your father and your mother and he who curses his father or mother, let him be put to death. But you say, whoever says to his father or mother, whatever profit you might have received from me as a gift to God, then he need not honor his father or mother. Thus you have made the commandment of God in no effect by your tradition. Hypocrites. Well, did Isaiah prophesy about you saying, these people draw near to me with their mouth and honor me with their lips, but their heart is far from me. And in vain they worship me, teaching as doctrines the commandments of men. In the, name of the Father, Son, and the Holy Spirit. Beautiful. Beautiful. So we started out, right? As we we're finishing up Matthew chapter 14. We start out with Jesus giving us, giving us an example of going off to a private area to pray to our Father in heaven from the honesty of our hearts. That makes sense. But Jesus is interrupted, right? He doesn't get to finish that private time, but he doesn't get upset, does he? No, he doesn't get upset at all. And as we see this, as Jesus starts to walk on the water, right? And this is what I wrote in the notes. It says, the storms of life can sometimes feel like our lives are dangerous, but truthfully, we overreact to our storms, just like the disciples. At first glance, we notice the fear of the disciples thinking what they saw in the water was a ghost. But in verse 27, but in verse 27, Jesus says, be of good cheer, it is I. We're starting to see the deity of Christ 
Look at Exodus chapter 13, verse 14. And God said to Moses, I am, I am who I am. And he said, thus you shall say to the children of Israel, I am has sent me to you. Beautiful, beautiful. Get back here. All right. So he says, be of good cheer. Right. So I am, that, that is the, the that is the divine name of God. When they got back into the boat, what the wind ceased. What happened in verse 32? The wind ceased, right? Jesus trying to comfort disciples by saying he is God and is the one to quiet their storm. Let's look at Matthew real quick. So Matthew chapter 8, verses 23 through 27. Now, when he got into the boat, his disciples followed him. And suddenly a great temp tempest arose on the sea. So the boat was covered with waves, but he was asleep. Then the disciples came to him and awoke him, saying, Lord, save us, we are perishing. And he said to them, Why are you fearful? Oh, you of little faith. Then he arose and rebuked the winds and sea, and there was a great calm. So the men marveled, saying, Who can this be that even the winds and sea obey him? So we see his deity, right? Only God, right, can make the winds and rain stop. So that was the second time. What we read here in Matthew, right? So what we're seeing is the second time, right? When they're on the water. This was the second time the Lord had permitted his disciples, what, to be in a storm, right? Does that make sense? So it's the second time he's permitted them to be in a storm. He was with them for the first time, and this time he, what, left them alone. The storm was permitted to, what, test their faith and strengthen them so he will always be with them amidst the storms of life. Then we see Peter, right? Then Peter comes in, right? So Peter's strong faith would allow him the confidence to walk on water. But Pete and Peter desires to what? Be with the Lord. And it had nothing to do with walking on water. Peter wasn't arrogant, but instead he had this hunger for God. It's integrity that keeps us focused on the Lord. And Peter was, was good, but lost focus and allowed the destruction of the storm to get him to doubt. So the word for doubt in Greek, it also means wavering or hesitation, right? Peter hesitated not because of the storm, but due to what is doubt. Was Jesus rebuking the storm or Peter? Let's be honest. I'm gonna, let's be honest, right? The answer to above question is Jesus was rebuking Peter. And, and when we are, are in our storms of life, there are no excuses, but instead buckle up and endure and trust in God. That's true integrity, the feeling of contentment in Christ. Every misfortune, every failure, every loss may be transformed. God has the power to, tr to transform all misfortunes into God's sins. Mrs. Charles E. Cowan said that. So Peter cried out. So I had that quote first. So Peter cried out, Lord, save me. Peter was in panic. And this was a prayer of panic. And the Lord was there to keep Peter afloat. Peter was honest before God. His only failure was his doubt. But even in that, he was honest before God. So remember that he was honest before God, even in his doubt, right? As we get into Matthew 15, right? But closing out, right? Closing out 14, we see how the healings continued. But it was because the honesty of faith, the, the people who were being healed, they have, they have their, their honesty was their faith. Right? As we get into the first nine verses here in Matthew 15. So the first nine verses of Matthew 15, we see honesty of Jesus. Look at verse two. It says, why do you transgress? Did, why do you transgress the tradition of the elders? Right? So why do you transgress right, the tradition of the elders? So the trans, why do you, why are they transgressing them? Jesus is refers to the, the interpretation of the law of Moses by all Jewish religious leaders. Our Lord re rebukes all their views that ritual purity depends on our outward actions. Right? So Jesus, on the other hand, says it's all about the state of one's heart. Look at verse 8. These people draw near to me with their mouth and honor me with their lips, but their heart is far from me. So what, he, so what he's saying, on the other hand, right? He's saying that our purity is the state of our heart. It's in verse eight. And the heart determines what a person's true 
security, right? Christ is honest with the Pharisees in verses three and six. We see his honesty to them, right? Saying that man's religious traditions cannot supersede the commandment of God. True devotion to God includes obedience and service to others. And these two things can never be separated. The honesty of God is that the Pharisees had failed in their service to the people. The Pharisees lacked honesty, honesty not only before God, but they also failed in being honest to the people, you know, Father, Son, and the Holy Spirit. Beautiful. So as we finish up, here's our in our Old Testament readings, Genesis chapter 41, starting in verse 41, and we'll end in Genesis chapter 42, verse 38. Get to those readings. Thank you all again for following. So here we go. Starting in Genesis. Starting in verse 41, in the name of the Father, the Son, and the Holy Spirit. And Pharaoh said to Joseph, see, I have set you over all the land of Egypt. And the Pharaoh took his signet ring off his hand and put it on Joseph's hand. And he clothed him in garments of fine linen and put a gold chain around his neck. And he had him ride in the second chariot, which he had. And they cried out before him, bow the knee. So he said to him over all the land of Egypt, Pharaoh said to Joseph, I am Pharaoh. Without your consent, no man may lift his hand or foot in all the land of Egypt. And Pharaoh called Jason, and Pharaoh called Joseph's name Zephaniah. And he gave him a wife, Asenna, the daughter of Potipera, priest of On. So Joseph went out over all the land of Egypt. Joseph was 30 years old when he stood before Pharaoh, the king of Egypt. And Joseph went out from the presence of Pharaoh and went throughout all the land of Egypt. Now, in the seven plentiful years, the ground brought forth abundantly. So he gathered up all the food of the seven years, which were in the land of Egypt, and laid up the food in the cities. He laid up in every city the food of the fields which surround them. Joseph gathered very, very much grain as the sand of the sea until, until he stopped counting, for it was immeasurable. And to Joseph were born two sons before the years of famine came, whom in his son, the daughter a Fothi, a priest of On, born to him. Joseph called the name of the firstborn, Menasah. For God has made me forget all my toil and all my father's house. In the name of the second, he called Ephraim. For God has caused me to be fruitful in the land of my affliction. In the seven years of plenty, which were in the land of Egypt, ended. In the seven years of famine began to come as Joseph had said the famine was in all the lands but in all the land of Egypt there was bread so when all the land of Egypt was famished the people cried out to Pharaoh for bread the Pharaoh said to all the Egyptians go to Joseph whatever he, he says to you do the famine was over all the face of the earth and Joseph opened all the storehouses and sold to the Egyptians the famine became severe in the land of Egypt so all the countries came to Joseph in Egypt to buy grain because the famine was severe in all the lands. Joseph's brothers go to Egypt, Genesis chapter 42. When Jacob saw that there was no grain in Egypt, Jacob said to his sons, why do you look at one another? And he said, indeed, I have heard that there is grain in Egypt. Go down to that place and buy for us there that we may live and not die. So Joseph's 10 brothers went down to buy grain in Egypt. But Jacob did not send Joseph's brother's Benjamin with his brother, for he said, lest some calamity befall him. The sons of Israel went to buy grain among those who had journeyed for the famine to the land of Canaan. Now Joseph was governor over the land, and it was he who sold to all the people of the land. And Joseph's brothers came and bowed down before him with their faces to the earth. Joseph saw his brothers and recognized him. But he acted as a stranger to them and spoke roughly to them. Then he said to them, where did you come from? And they said, from the land of Canaan to buy food. So, Jace, so Joseph recognized his brothers, but they did not recognize him. Then Joseph remembered the dreams which he, he had dreamed about them and said to them, you are spies. You'll come to see the nakedness of the land. And they said to him, no, my Lord, but your servants have come to buy food. We are all 
one man's sons. We are honest men. Your servants are not spies. But he said to them, no, but you have come to see the nakedness of the land. And they said, your servants are, t- your servants are 12 brothers, the sons of one, of one man in the land of Canaan. In fact, the youngest is with our father today, and, no, and, and one is no more. But Joseph said to them, it is as I spoke to you, saying, you are spies. In this manner, you shall be tested. By the life of Pharaoh, you shall not leave this place unless your youngest brother comes here. Send one of you and let him bring your brother, and you shall be kept in prison, that your words may be tested to see whether there is any truth in you, or else by the life of Pharaoh, surely you are spies. So he put them all together in prison three days. Then Joseph said to them the third day, do this and live, for I fear God. If you are honest men, let, let one Your brothers be confined to your prison house, but you go and carry grain for the famine of your houses and bring your youngest brother to me. So your words will be verified and you shall not die. And they did so. Then they said to one another, we are truly guilty concerning our brother, for we saw the anguish of his soul when he pleaded with us. And we would not hear. Therefore, distress has come upon us. And Reuben answered them, saying, Did I not speak to you, saying, do not sin against the boy, and you would not listen? Therefore, behold, his blood is not required of us. But they did not know that Joseph understood them. For he spoke to to them through an interpreter. And he turned himself away from them and wept. And he returned to them again and talked with them. And he took Simeon from them and bound him before their eyes. The brothers returned to Canaan. Then Joseph gave a command to fill their sacks rain to restore every man's money to a sack to give them provisions for the journey thus he did for them that, that they loaded their donkeys with the grain and departed from there but as one of them opened his sack to give his donkey feed at the encampment he saw his money and there it was in the mouth of his sack so he said to his brothers my money has been restored and there it is in, in my sack and their hearts fell them and they were afraid saying to one another What is this that God has done to us? Then they went to Jacob, their father in the land of Canaan, and told him all that happened to them, saying, The man who is Lord of the land spoke roughly to us and took us for spies of the country. But but we said to him, We are honest men. We are not spies. We are twelve brothers, sons of our father. One is no more, and the youngest is with our father this day in the land of Canaan. The man. Then the man, the Lord of the country, said to us, By this I will know that you are honest men. Leave, leave one of your brothers here with me. Take food for the famine of your households and be gone. And bring your youngest brother to me, so I, so I shall know that you are not spies, but that you are honest men. I will, grant you, I will grant your brother to you, and you may trade in the land. Then it happened as they emptied their sacks, that surprisingly each man's bundle of money was in his sack. And when they and their father saw the bundles of money, they were afraid. And Jacob, their father, said to them, you have bewavered me. Joseph is no more. Simeon is no more. And you want to take Benjamin? All these things are against me. Then Reuben spoke to his father, saying, kill my two sons if I do not bring him back to you. And put him, put him in my hands, and I will bring him back to you. But he said, my son shall not go down with you. for Your brother is dead, and he is left alone. If any calamity should befall him along the way, would you go? Then you would bring down my gray hair of sorrow to the grave. In the name of the Father, Son, and the Holy Spirit. Beautiful. So back when we started, as we were ending Genesis chapter 41. So let's look at verse 52. Right? So verse 52. It says, and the name of the second he called Ephraim. For God has caused me to be fruitful in the land of my affliction. So we see the honesty of, of Joseph. For he calls what the land, he calls Egypt the land of his humiliation. For all those who see this fallen world the way Joseph saw Egypt. And blessed be to those who like Joseph look for the inheritance and the world that is to come. Hebrews chapter 11. Verses 13 and 16. These all died in faith, not having received the promise, but having seen them afar off, 
were sure to them embrace them and confess that they were strangers and pilgrims on earth. For those who say such things declare plainly that they seek a homeland. And truly, if they had called to mind that country from which they had come out, they would have had the opportunity to return. But now they desire a better, that is heavenly country. Therefore, God is not ashamed to be called their God, for he has prepared a city for them. Verse 22, by faith, Joseph, when he was dying, they mentioned the departure of the children of Israel and gave instructions concerning his bones, the Father, Son, and the Holy Spirit. Beautiful. So let's go back now. So Genesis chapter 42. So starting in verse 22. So So what, what we see, right? This, oh, where's my Bible at? So what we see, right, is the laziness of Joseph's brothers, right? So Joseph's brothers were lazy. And according to scripture, lazy people become unruly. Second Thessalonians chapter three, verses six through twelve, warning against idleness. Right? So make a note of that. Right? So according to scripture, lazy people will eventually become unruly. Lazy people lack fruit and seem to what lack self-control, especially in speech. And according to St. John Cass Cassian, they are quick to abuse others. These sinful passions and truths were also seen in Joseph's brothers. When they sold him away to Egypt. Okay. Let's look at verse 18. Verse 18 says, And Joseph said to them the third day, Do this and live. For I fear God. So Joseph's honesty to his brothers, that he truly feared God is the beginning of wisdom. Still, his brothers did not fear God. And according to, to St. Anesius the Great, they would not listen to his wise counsel when they sinned against him. And they ended up with a guilty conscience. This is normal for those who lack truth, honesty, and integrity. Joseph's dreams were right all along. Joseph stayed truthful and honest and never lacked integrity before God, regardless of his afflictions. So his brothers ended up with guilty conscience. Right? So we'll end our study for today. <clears throat> Thank you all again for following. Get ready to close out with our blessing. Yeah. Close out with our blessing. Here it is. Thank you all again for following. May the Lord bless you and keep you. The Lord make his face shine upon you and be merciful to you. The Lord lift up his countenance upon you and give you peace. In the Father, Son, and the Holy Spirit, both now and forever. The sages. Amen. The Lord is our shepherd. Love you all so much. Have a blessed day.